Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a step back from looking at magnetic fields specifically, because now we've met the three types of fields we're going to come across in the course. We've met gravitational fields, we've met electric fields, and finally we've met magnetic fields. So I wanted to step back from that and look at a few similarities between the types of fields and also some key differences between them. So first of all, I want to explain what the point of uh, this model of fields is. So fields are a concept used to explain how objects can exert a force on each other without them actually touching one another. So we say the objects are creating a field in the space around them and it, that can interact with other fields and that's what's producing a force. So then looking at more in terms of drawing a diagram to show a field. So field lines are used to show a couple of things, but one of the key things that they indicate is that how strong a field is. So closer lines indicates a stronger field or more separated lines indicates a weaker field. So looking at fields generally, there are two categories that they generally fit into and any more complicated field will be built from these two things. So the first type is what we call a uniform field and we tend to come across these um, quite often in fact. So when we're dealing with gravity especially at GCSE type level we're dealing with what we call a uniform gravitational field and what that means is wherever a mass is, it will experience the same weight force. So at GCSE, remember, we use the equation W equals mg. So what we're saying is that anywhere on Earth, a mass will experience the same weight force wherever you put it. So we're saying that um, the gravitational field on the surface of the Earth is pretty much the same everywhere. So we call it a uniform field and we draw that like you can see here. So the lines are all equally spaced to show that the field is the same strength everywhere. We've also come across um, uniform electric fields and we didn't call them that necessarily, but we've come across them. So where you have a positive plate and a negative plate, um, um, you get, as long as they're parallel to one another, you get a uniform electric field. So wherever we put a charge in this field, it would experience the same electric force. Um, let's actually be put that in and be specific, same electric force. Now to uh, go sideways on this one, we have actually also met uniform um, magnetic fields. So where we used bar magnets, so let's say we've got a North Pole here and a South Pole here. And uh, we represent the field between them like this. So again, we've created what we'd call a uniform magnetic field. So wherever we put a moving charge particle in this field, it will experience the same force. Um, so we've actually got a third type, so uniform magnetic field. OK, so those are our uniform fields. So. Let's come back to our general field. So that's uniform, where the force is the same wherever you put the object. A radial is different to that. So actually, the force something experiences changes depending on where you put the object in the field. So um, a, once we get away from the surface of the Earth, and we can start considering the Earth as a sphere and its interaction maybe with the sun or with other planets, we now think of the Earth as having what we call a radial gravitational field. And what that means is if we have a mass and we move it further and further away from the planet, it will actually experience a smaller and smaller weight force. Um, and that is represented on this diagram. You can see the further away from the planet we get, the further apart these field lines get, uh, which indicates the field is getting weaker. And it's the same thing. We've come across this with um, electric fields. Uh, we drew the radial fields for a positive charge and a negative charge. And it, again, it indicates that as you move away from it, if you put a charge there, it'll experience a weaker and weaker 
electric force. Um, we haven't really particularly looked at radial magnetic fields, so I'm not going to go into that. These are the main two types of radial fields we meet as part of the course. Okay, so those are the two types of general fields, uniform and radial. And anything, as I said, anything more complicated can be made up of uniform and radial fields. OK, so what I want to do is highlight some differences between the types of fields that we've met. So gravitational, electric and magnetic. So the most obvious difference is what they're created by and what objects can experience them. And you'll notice that the objects that create a field are also the objects that experience a force from those fields. So gravitational fields are created by objects with mass. Um, so, like, so example we've used, so we've used the Earth. Um, I, as a person with mass, have my own gravitational field as well. Anything with mass has a gravitational field around it. So electric fields are created by objects with charge, so that can be either positive or negative. So what this means is neutral particles do not have an electric field around them, but positive and negative charges do. Magnetic fields are created by moving objects, so the object has to be moving, it cannot be stationary, and it also has to have charge. So it has two things that you need in order to create one. So if you have a charge, but it's stationary, it does not have a magnetic field, you need a current to produce a magnetic field. Um, so another key difference is what the field line arrow direction tells you. So if we look back at our diagrams, you'd see these field lines have arrows on them, whether they're radial or whether they're uniform. So with a gravitational field, the arrow tells you the direction. If you put a mass inside the field, it tells you the direction it would experience a force. Um, so with gravitational fields, you see the arrow always points inwards because it's always attractive. So it'll always pull objects in towards it. Um, an electric field, the line tells you the direction a positive charge would experience an electric force. That's just a convention. It, we could have done it with negative, but we didn't. We agreed that we would all show the direction a positive charge experiences a force. So you can see a positive charge would be repelled by this positive charge so that they point away. A positive charge would be attracted, which is why the arrows point inwards. With a magnetic field, they don't tell you about the direction of the force, and that's really important, actually. So the field lines for a magnetic field tell you the direction the north hand of a compass will point if you put it into that field. So if you just get a plotting compass, stick it in the field, the arrow will point in the direction of the arrow. So where did I put that diagram here? So if I stuck a compass in here, so let's actually do that. So let's put a compass in. So a compass has a north hand and a south hand. The north hand is usually red, the south hand is usually blue. So you can see the north hand will point in the direction of the arrow, so it will point towards the south pole there. OK, so as I said, it is really key that you know that the field lines in a magnetic field do not tell you the direction that a moving charge particle experiences a force. That's what we use Fleming's left hand rule for, uh, but it's an important distinction to make. OK, so what we're going to talk about to finish off is the interaction of two fields. So in order to produce a force, you have to have two fields interacting. So if you just have one field on its own, there will be no force. You need two of them and you need their fields overlapping one another. So another key thing is that a field can only interact with a field of the same type. So um, let's say we take the nucleus of an atom. So that is positively charged. So it has an electric field around it, and that can interact with the electric fields of the electrons that are orbiting around it. A nucleus also has mass, which means it has a gravitational field. And electrons also have mass, so they can interact with each other through um, a weight force as well. But the electric field doesn't interact with the gravitational field. That's not possible. So let's have a look at the production of two types of forces. We'll do gravitational first and then we'll do a magnetic one as well. So 
Here what we've got is a interaction between two objects. So maybe this is the sun and maybe this is the earth or it could be the earth and the moon or something like that. So the key, a larger mass will have a stronger gravitational field. So basically the more mass you have, the stronger the field around you gets, which is why we've drawn more lines around the sun than the earth so that the lines are closer together showing a stronger field. Okay, so when the two fields interact, both objects experience a force. And this is something you have to wrap your head around because we kind of think about, well, we know the Earth experiences a force from the sun because it's what pulls us into an orbit and keeps us going in a circle. But actually, the sun experiences a force from the Earth and that produces what's called wobble. So if you uh, go online and look up like the sun's wobble, you will see the sun is actually in a tiny orbit of its own because of the forces it's experiencing from the planet. And a key thing to know about those forces is they are equal in size, but opposite in direction. So the Earth experiences a weight force from the sun and the sun experiences an equal weight force from the Earth, but in the opposite direction. So those two forces are pulling these two objects or trying to pull those two objects closer together, but they're equal in the size. The fact that the sun isn't very affected very much by this weight force is because the sun's mass is so much bigger than that of the Earth. But they experience an equal and opposite weight force due to the interaction of their two gravitational fields. We met the interaction of magnetic fields when we talked about the motor effect. So essentially we have two field, magnetic fields that overlap and produce magnetic forces. So we saw the example where a uniform magnetic field overlaps with the circular field of a um, current carrying wire. So here we've got a current going into the page. So if we use Maxwell's right hand rule, point our thumb at the page, we can see that it produces a clockwise field around it. So what we're going to look at is what happens if we put the wire actually into the uh, uniform field. So at the moment it's sitting outside it, so we're not going to get a magnetic force. What we're going to do is we're going to plop it inside that field, like you can see over here on the right hand side, you can see the wires being put inside the field, and look at what happens when those two fields interact. So we're actually going to add a little bit more detail in how the two fields interact with each other. So if you get field lines in the same direction, so you can see up here at the top, the uniform field lines are pointing to the right, and so are the circular field lines you have around the charge. So what you get is a region of really high line density here up at the top, because they've essentially added together, and that's what you get here. At the bottom, you can see the field lines from the uniform field are still to the right, the ones from the circular field are to the left, so they effect effectively cancel each other out. So you end up with this region of really low field line density. The field lines are quite spread out at that point. So the wire will experience a force from high field line density to low field line density. So you can see it experiences a force this way. So this is describing the magnetic force on the conductor. But as we've just seen, this should produce a pair of forces. So actually, the magnetic field, so that's the north and the south pole, will experience a force upward equal to that. So there's always an equal and opposite force. So in this case, the actual permanent magnet will experience a force upwards in the opposite direction. And that force will be equal to this one here. But usually our permanent magnet's mass is so much bigger than that of the wire. We don't really see the effect of that uh, very often, uh, but we can do if we're doing experiments to measure it there. So that's the interaction of magnetic fields. And I'll use um, this as an opportunity to stop looking at these general laws of fields.